Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome back uh, to this uh, new lecture that is lecture number 8, where we are going to talk about the development of a comics in the western world. Right? So, what we have been talking about that how certain development occurred, what are the changes that took place and how uh, uh, that comic strips, right? it became so popular and even middle class people started uh, reading about it. How the color was highly influenced by the market forces. So, and also you see that gothic kind of a theme and a form was also introduced in the comics because of the industrial revolutions and even in the industrial revolutions because of certain experiments certain innovations or let us say certain invention that happened like x-rays, photographic images, they also revolutionized comic uh, culture. So, today we are going to talk where we left in the last class the development of a comics in the western world. So, I was talking about how a comic also changed the lifestyle. Right? So, at this point, having mentioned that gothic themes were prevalent in the visual cultures of late 19th century, it is imperative to mention some dichotomies that mark the genre as well as the press industries. So, while early on picture stories were mostly uh, published by the comic press, it is a uh, was with the work of Frederick Bernard, right? That you see on your screen, that the serious press too started showing interest in picture stories, specifically after the publication of. Let me write the name for you. Uh, here I would say, precocious pite, or what? became the what became of the naughty right naughty little boy right so who would go behind the scene so this came out in 1868 and i'm sure that you would if you see on the screen on your uh, laptop or mobile phone wherever you're watching you could see this descriptions, right. So, Bernard wanted to find a way in which what he believed to be the limiting Tofferian tunnel vision, keep this mind, right, because they were constantly looking at Tofferian tunnel vision, right, could be opened up to further the drive of exploration while maintaining the progressive action on the stage, where the character's journey through the page would not confine the reader to the same tunnel space as a solution. So, Bernard veered towards right arabesque technique. Write down this please, uh, so that it will be helpful for you. Right, Arabesque technique. So, here you see which saw the flow of narrative from the point of a view of a simultaneity and totality by creating drawing that would be connected by serpentine lines of a text or integrated by some curious structure of a broken curves or they could be loosely arranged on the white page like island in a slowly meandering streams. So, this curvilinear method of representing sequential progressive action, right? this curvilinear let me write it for you. So, that uh, you can understand curvy 
linear method of representing sequential progressive action became a staple for most artists who would write in the above mentioned magazine from the 1870s to 1890s. The arabesque, right, this one, this technique led to pseudo gothic style. Pseudo gothic style that worked particularly well in conjunction with versification and folk tales and was a formidable rival to the Tofarian form of a picture stories. So, the first general monthly magazine is Harper's new monthly magazine that was launched in as you could see 1850 and alternated between gothic and Tofarian picture stories with some arts like and then we have a Frank Bello attempting new variation between the two. So, this gothic turn in picture stories is epitomized by the work of the artist who has been mentioned earlier as having digressed from Hogarth and Topfer in creating a third variation of the picture story. Wilhelm Busch who caught the attention of the public by his initial work published in the German magazine Flinger de Blatter since the 1860s. This one, right? You could see the name is written here. And then Bush's work are considered to be directly influenced by German Gothic revival, which thrived on an authentic sense of carnivalesque and grotesque in the genre. Much later, toward the end of the 19th century, German American artist Rudolf Dux was amply inspired by Bush aesthetic and also modeled the Kajemzamer Kits, right? Kajemzamer Kits was first published in 18, uh, it was first published in 1897, right? And was so popular and it continued, right? It continued publication even after Doc's departure from the property in 1912 when it was like in when the mantle of continuing the spirit strip was passed on to Harold Nair who drew for 35 years from 1940 till his death. So, moving ahead I would like to explain you first what is the carnivalesque right. So, I am sure that you are very familiar with the Bhaktin and as you see that constantly I am referring the name called Bhaktin right. What is the contribution of the Bhaktin in the comic culture? As you see, what is a carnivalesque? First, think about the festival called Holi, right? What happens in the Holi? The way we celebrate Holi, we usually use the color on the faces or on the body, and in this particular day, we become very happy. We are merry, we are celebrating equally with everyone without differentiating. And the very idea of the Holi was that everyone, even the king and the peon, they both will come together and they will celebrate without marking any difference in terms of a hierarchy or in terms of a position, right? So, carnivalesque was introduced also in the literature keeping in the mind that the certain voices are available in literature which has a potentiality to dismantle the hierarchy which means it is not always the authorial voice or the protagonist voice will be taken into the consideration but there are a lot of voices which are trying to dismantle or which are challenging the authorial position, all right. So, this is what the carnivalesque uh, method or you say carnival uh, term that was coined by Michel Bhaktin, all right. So, Michel Bhaktin was the purpose to challenge the traditional authority or traditional way of approaching the text. Here also in the comics, uh, you see that this kind of a technique became into the fashion and people are talking about the carnivalesque in the picture and which is why on your screen I have shown you the Kanzamer kits, right, Can Katanzamer kits and it was as I said it was a first published in 1897, all right. So, uh, uh, Bush work at the juncture to this point out the general assumption 
that the Bush stories constitute a direct link between the Tofarian form and the American comic strip. If on a one hand, right, if on a one hand, Toffer's picture stories mocked the rigid logic of cause and effect, right, Toffer's picture stories mocked. So, you remember what I have been talking about Tofarian idea of a casualty, right, causality. So, what happens in the causality that you have to know that there is an effect because of the cause, right. So, there is a cause that is responsible for a particular effect that took place, right. So, this is a, our traditional way of understanding, right. This is how we look at any kind of a art or any kind of a things is happening around the society and this is because of scientific view of scientific thinking of explaining the society or explaining what is happening around the world. So, they all believe that there is an effect for which there is a cause and which is why you see that uh, sometime what happens there is lot of things goes unexplained, they go unexplained the very idea that why they are going unexplained because we are not able to find out the cause behind that effect. So, if we are not able to find the cause without behind the effect, then we see that things are not uh, being explained to us, be, it is not making any sense to us, we are not able to understand that why this is happening, right. So, this is a causality and this is a traditional way of looking at it. So, this Tofarian, Tofer challenged this technique, right. He did not like this, he overthrew it, alright. So, look at the slides again. Now, you see on the slides that this uh, Toffer's picture stories, this mocked the rigid logic of cause and effect that dominated the industrial world. On the other hand, Bush stories offered homage to the poetic logic of the legend and the folk tale presented in the style that was, that was rustic and even mirrored the structure of nursery rhymes. So, Dirks not only took inspiration from Bush, but also departed from him like most other illustrator of the 1880s and 1890s by following a positivist form of a mechanical burlesque that entirely rested on the visual logic of cause and effect using the genre of the wordless gags right G A G S. This development in the medium of a comics would soon witness bountiful application in the upcoming medium of the cinema. So, the first of such gags, right, this is Rudolf Ducks. The first of such gags that Ducks used in the Cat Jam Zammer kits, which is also considered the prototypical gag, right, and was variation in the horse, horse gag. So, the, in the horse gag, look at this painting, uh, sorry, look at this picture again. In the horse gag, a man is a seen, look at like I am asking you to pay attention, right. See this, it is a beautiful way uh, we can explain this. In the horse gag, a man is a seen running a horse, right, a horse, when suddenly the horse stops working because unknown to the man, there is another mischievous person in the background who blocks the hose. When the man running the hose puts the front of the hose to his eyes to check whether anything is stuck inside, the mischief monger releases the block and water comes spurting out in full force on the face of the man with the hose, alright, you see that. So, instances of the mischief gag, let me write it for you, M I E S C H I E F, mischief gag, would populate the comedies of the likes of Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton, right. So, according to early cinema historian Tom Gunning, the mischief gag proliferated as the first emergent genre in early cinema and introduce audience to the stock character of the rascal, while also serving the audience with the tool of anticipation, which was made possible because of the sequence addressed 
the spectators directly with the visual display rather than a developed narrative action right so before i uh, move ahead let me tell you right so let's say for example if you are watching a movie right when you are watching a movie you see certain sounds of shrieking or birds are chirping or owl is speaking this is a nothing but a i would say visual display that is trying to suggest to you a kind of a, like you are going to anticipate that what is going to happen the next let's say for example in the night if you are sitting in a hall alone and eating your dinner and suddenly you see that owl is like crying right bat is flying and you see that suddenly the lights are going dim so and and there is a howling of a jackal on the background it's a nothing but a visual display to to so that uh, audience can anticipate that audience can anticipate that there is something frightening or something is approaching to him something bad or a ghost or weird thing going to take place right this is the anticipation with the help of a visual display right so there is no narrative there is no uh, 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 it's not like someone is going to come and I'm telling you, hey, look, you are going to have a dine here. And after 10 minutes, you will see that a ghost will appear here and you are not supposed to eat something like that. It's not going to happen, right? So it's just a visual display and we are going to anticipate. In the same way, there are certain rascals were introduced in the comics. And the moment we see that kind of rascal, we immediately laugh, right? I'm sure let me like i'm not calling johnny lever as a rascal please not rajpal yadav as a rascal or other comedian but the moment you see you enjoy oh he or she is available in this picture or in this film so now it means that it is going to entertain us right so there is a certain kind of image formed on a particular figure so this is a something called when we when we are introducing a rascal right so when the rascal is introduced we are going to understand that now something funny going to happen right or something mischievous right i would not say evil but i would say mischievous going to happen so this is a called mischief gag right so going back to the slides now you see here we have that it is a uh, 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 it is that the, 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 this it is to be noted that this relation between let us say come like I would say that uh, this is a kind of a visual display rather than developed narratic action where you like where audience is given a tool to anticipate what is going to happen. So while gags were never a part of Topfer's Oyor, the horse gag ensured the Topfer's saga of industrial stupidity morphed seamlessly into a playful crystalline allegory of a progress in the edition age and hence it comes with no surprise that the lifespan of the mischief gag genre right let me write again for you mischief gag genre right mischief gag genre so this mischief gag genre in the motion picture industry which means uh, just a second motion motion picture industry and that is around 1896 to 1905 exactly coincided with the early years of modern comic strip as well so it is to be noted now that the relationship between comics and early cinema is mutually dependent right so i'm talking about that comics and cinema they are dependent mutually right they are mutually dependent and not singularly derived from one or the other where elements of a comics motion picture are represented in the comic strip just as comics devices are translated onto what I say film aesthetics. All right. So, the distinction between the gothic 
arabesque picture stories and the comic narratives in strips was also reflected in the publishing sector when in Europe the graphic distinguished itself from the popular comic press as representative of rationality and objectivity. So, whereas the latter was seen as a barbaric on the other hand Harper's weekly among other magazines in America stuck to the publication of a comic material based on the old grammar of hieroglyphics emblems and allegories leading to the ease of its inclusion in popular culture than its European counterpart and this may be an indication as to why the comic strip thrived reasonably better in the American setting. So, now you see here uh, that I am also uh, talking about that this modern comic strip format 19 like it is around 1890s showed a marked difference from the earliest picture stories of the 1840s specifically in the narrative structure which the later used progressive action in the comparison to the rather sequential action right. So, this is here right. So, this means that the earlier the page page was expanded to accommodate a large range of action either spatially arranged or cramped together whereas, later the page space was split into the section showing now the S while progressive action across pages as sequentially placed panels in a manner that the minute actions which were earlier boxed in together would not enjoy a separate space hence giving the reader an easier narrative flow. So, this role of the reader as a detective was thus in most cases I would say toned down to that of a mass consumer which in turn increased the popular appeal of the comic strip. So, this shift from progressive action to the sequential visual narrative structure was possible and evidently transpired only after the invention of a photographic film in the form of a paper bagged film and roll film holder by George Eatsman, right. So, you remember this, this is the shift I am talking about that is from the progressive to the sequential visual narrative structure and that is was a possible uh, and also you see that uh, George Eastman also experiment with this. So, the most fascinating work which marks this juncture in the history of a comics which was defined by a fascination with the modern photograph are those by Arthur Burdett Frost right. And he published in Harper's newly monthly in 1879 and 1880s and in Harper's Bazaar during the mid 1880s. First book of a collected cartoons called a stuff and nonsense as you could see here A B Frost's book called stuff and nonsense that came out in 1883 is included a cartoon you could see even on the image you can see on the slide itself that this you know this cartoon where a painter looks at the photograph of a horse and wonders how people would rather believe in the photograph and not his painting of the horse, which is indicative of the critical insight that cartoonist and comic artist were starting to cultivate regarding the influx of photographic technology, right. So, let me reiterate this fact what A. B. Frost is doing in his uh, collected cartoons called stuff and nonsense where he has included a cartoon where a painter is looking at the photograph of a horse right he is looking at the photograph of a horse and he thinks that how would rather people believe in the photograph and not his a painting of a horse right. So, see I mean this is something uh, I would say more uh, creating a panic or let us say anxiety among the mind of the artist when uh, let us say camera came and I am sure that I mean 
hardly I see now people have interest for painting, right. So, now think for a second that when someone is creating the creating a painting of an horse, right. So, people find it less uh, original than a camera photographed a horse, right. So, you see that there is no doubt that uh, like here a camera, a technique is involved, a technique what I mean to say that a technology is involved and in the former case here is the creator's effort and intelligence and imagination is involved. But why we are supposed to read this stuff and nonsense, look at the title itself that why so that people changed their interest from painting to camera, right. Because that be everyone cannot become a painter, but that also true that everyone cannot become a photographer. But it is ok, because painting like needs a time and energy and effort and imagination where with the help of a camera you do not require. So, now as a student of a literature, I would like to make a point here for you that we are living in a world where we want everything so quickly in a very less period of time everything should become possible for us, right. So, this is this is a kind of a habit where it is directly challenging our critical insight and intellectual rigor, because what happens in a painting you need to have a patience, right. But in a camera it is a fine, the patience is not required. In fact, you do not even look at the image properly, but what a painter do, right. What does a painter do? A painter looks at the photograph and he minutely observes each and everything meticulously and then he paints. But as a cameraman, I am sure I am not talking about a very professional photographer, but I am talking about people like us, we what we do, we do not even look at what we are view, viewing. In fact, we come back home and we see the pictures and then we think how beautiful it was. See, we were very much near to that particular object but we never appreciated the beauty which we captured in the camera and later on sitting at home we are talking about that how beautiful photo is, right. So, you think about that I am sure I am not going to the postmodern art and all, but I am seriously talking about the kind of anxiety that it created among the mind of artists. At the same time here you see now two things are brought together by the book called this stuff and nonsense, one side we have a painter and another side we have a photographer, all right. So, going back to the AV forest, look at the slide please. Now, you see that it is a nothing, but it is basically talking about that that influx of a photographic technology, right. And this is specific inspiration, right. This is specific inspiration for Frost cartoon was based in the innovation in chrono photography, right. Let me write it for you, C H like already is uh, mentioned, right. So, this specific trans inspiration for, us for Frost's cartoon was based in the innovation in chrono photography and cinematoph cinematography as pioneered by Californian photographer Edward Mabris, right. This was the person, all right. So, Frost was introduced to Mabris experiment on the motion of animals through his interaction with famous American painter Thomas Ekins. When he joined Ekins drawing class at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in September 1878, Mabris goal was to analyze the temporal and dynamic progression of the photographed action and the layout of the plates had to highlight the signifying difference between each instant which necessitated the recording and displaying of the face of a movement with as much uniformity as was possible, right. So, this led to the use of a repetitive grid which became a major feature of Frost's work in the comics medium where there would be minimal visual difference. Look at this uh, photo and that you recall is this one minimal visual difference across the panel and the primary importance would be to translate the progressive action of my breeze, so plate into sequential action on the comic page 
linked by forces of cause and effect all right so so the idea is like you see these plates right this is how creative it is this is a static but the zone the dynamic right that there is a progression there is a that picture or the horses are in motion right there is no such horse of level in these plates which you can say that they are not in the motion right so they all are in the motion so here you see that there is a minimal visual difference like there are almost 16 plates shown in the picture right and all the 16 plates are talking about a particular horse obviously a man is riding the horse but it's not about the man it's more about the horse or you can say both uh, it does not matter to me much but what matters to me that how this each horse motion or zone this visual differences right each plates are different and they all are speaking about that how they all are different in terms of a motion which means the prior is not the same as the current it is the next plate is different the next plate is different right so this is kind of new kind of expression that we notice in this particular experiments done by Edward Breeze. all right so moving ahead going back to the slide you see that uh, Frost was aware Frost was aware of both right J J Grandville is a study in expressions where the changing expression of a man on opening a door and thinking that he saw a ghost are displayed in a sequence and Ekin's demonstration of zoetrope right which is a circular device which is a circular device in which images are arranged and the device rotated as so as to give an illusion of a motion right let me go back first to the first picture just to talk about what it is right so here you see interestingly what you find that they all are uh, talking about uh, this this jj grand village is talking about expression right and you see that there are almost 10 uh, plates the 10 plates are nothing but it is shown the expression of the image in the, all the 10 plates you interestingly see the motion of or you see the expression of the face so even by looking at the expression of the face you can easily understand what is happening think for a second about the film right when even the ghost has not appeared right even it has not come into like it is has not come into the screen before that you realize that there is something going on because you see the face of uh, the character which is present on the screen and you see the way it is changing obviously when there is a ghost appearance the character will not be laughing but suppose after a point of time you see that there is a face is shrinking it's a frightening it is frightened face and he's running behind like he's running around and after a point of time he looks at someone like he's looking at somewhere and he's laughing and he said oh you are here and then you will immediately understand oh no it, 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 he or she is not a ghost it is someone who is familiar with right is very much known how did you know that you got to know only through the expression so what JJ Grandville is doing he is showing nothing but a study in expression so going back to the slide look at these slides again and read this face for five minutes and then only you move so look at this first one going to have a good sleep right now you see this face right going to have a good sleep now you see this face what my door is open but more than that you look at the expression you understand a strange noise now you see the expression now see this expression this expression and this expression right this three expression you see the change slight change slight difference but is speaking a lot someone is moving who is there now you see this face and this face right this face and this face 
this is a transition right but this transition is shown by this right so these three phases had already been made and there is also possibility right with the imagination they would have just shown you not these three images right not these three images but directly this and directly this but no this is not this is not the point the point is that how will grandville so then i study in expression and then here you see what happens thieves murder why after all it's only the cat now it is the cat and now you see ha 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 poor pushy how i frightened her so you see this one and this the travel from this face to this face this many journey is already covered right now moving to the next uh, a slide that you see on the zoetrope right what is happening in the zoetrope so basically nothing but moment to moment panel which what i have already spoken to you no moment to moment so what is happening in this moment to moment transition right that is that is that ekins is so casing of a zoetrope was that there was an undue dependence on the device itself for creating a motion rather than generating a discourse on causality and pre post image functions you see it's just so the motion so what frost imbibed from the two influences which also coincided with how mabris had conceptually conceived his experiment was that he could create a sequence he could create a sequence in which the temporal and dynamic information is given in the intervals between contiguous images hence setting the stage for the birth of the gutter space in comics which is the bit b which is the gap between two panels of a strip where time space and action contract and expand with the observation and imagination of the reader all right so moving ahead you see that however the most inventive and pioneering comic artist of the late 19th century did not stop at the spatio temporal revolution brought forth by the rise of a sequential narrative so you have to keep in the mind the that that how sequential narrative has related with spatio temporal revolutions right so it went on to usher an audio visual revolution in the medium of uh, comics by giving birth to another major semantic and structural aspect of modern comics the speech balloon right this one this is the speech balloon although the device that is known as speech balloon had been seen earlier in cartoons it was majorly absent in the picture story format during the 19th century instead the device that was used labeled words that were proportionate right that to were appropriate to a certain picture in the narrative was akin to the greek or the orthodox jewish phylactery right this is the english word uh, uh, for phylactery during the time that was strictly enough plain and simple label all right so the real function of label was the same as that of a phylactery in medieval times allowing the element in hieroglyph or in a rebus to clarify their function to present themselves while thomas rowlandson was responsible for keeping the tradition of a label keeping the function of a, keeping the tradition of labels alive in the 18th century picture stories george crookshank developed the label function in the 19th century to go beyond the hilarious uses in a more common place mechanism all right so now we are uh, going to talk about uh, uh, someone called richard felton outcalled right whom we have been waiting so far so what was maintained steadily till the mid 19th century by crookshank was sudden resurrected by richard felton outcalled and almost around the beginning of the 21st century 
with his timeless work the yellow cape it is my humble request to you all that please 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 read this one for sure or his new phonograph right i mean like i will be happy if you read both but at least i would request you read the yellow kid for sure right so this i mean uh, you must be like be familiar that yellow kid which is the inspiration behind yellow journalism so out called reached back to invoke the polygraphic space right uh, let me uh, refresh your memory if uh, if you have not forgotten about it right poly graphic humor which we have already talked right so polygraphic space polygraphic space of hogarth in his work by creating graphic spaces of a bewildering heterogeneity by bringing the emblematic fridge which holds figure in timeless poses beyond physical constraint and the suspended action which fixes a moment in one instant of a time when out called published the yellow kid and his new phonograph little did he know that it would change the direction of a narrative graphic storytelling in the days to come the perplexing fact is that the speech balloon did not catch the wave of comic creators immediately after out called yellow kid a story about it although the page itself created the site for an audio visual impact to be felt on paper in fact using balloons became systematic in american comics only from the end of the 19th century and in france from the 1920s right so it was not simply the effort of the pioneers of early comics that popularized the device that host the entire arena of speech thought or sound action it was actually the commercial success of the phonograph that considerably facilitated the adoption of the balloon at the expense of the older label in the following years so later this device was popularized further into distant corners of the globe through the fantastic depiction and uses by hods popular collector like tintin captain haddock and professor calculus among others right so hence the word balloon in the modern comic strip is not only a device undertaking the work of situating speech in the space time of slapstick without any reference to an extraneous authority but also something that 30 years before taking cinema was single handedly responsible for the creation of an audio visual stage on a paper so that would be the theoretical bedrock for all audio visual technological phenomena arising in the 20th century so holding the hands of richard fenton outcalled american comics started to go on a journey to become what the world would later recognize as a powerhouse of literary production in no country except the united state did the inception of comics come to be connected with illiterate or semi literate immigrant population so much so that even art spigligman believes comics to be quintessentially american medium going on to call it one of america's few indigenous art form so american artist like outcalled and binser mackey created the trend of writing in magazines that would only publish comics thus giving birth to comic magazines a very american format while outcalled was popular for hogan's alley also known as the yellow kid winsor mackey the next great comics artist was creating a novel kind of readership through his classic work little nemo in in slumberland where a kid named nemo right where a kid named uh, nemo goes to sleep every day and his horrid dreams only to wake up in the last panel in his bed so mackey winsor mackey got a kick start to hit to his little nemo nemo a year earlier with sammy snitch 
which could set the precedent for the former in a light hearted manner. Although Smaldren calls Mackay as the last of the burlesque, he also insists that Mackay was concerned not about death, but about life. How does one breathe life into comic art would be a question that would define much of his craft. So, this comic magazines were heavily influenced by pulp fiction covers and genres. In 1938, action comics you see that is launched and features the first superhero in the figure of a superman. The fantastical origin of a character so out of a world called for a grounded approach to this new kind of super powered being and hence in detective comics Batman was introduced as a normal human who could achieve the impossible with knowledge, physic, money hence paving the way for creating the American dream. So, uh, this uh, superhero comics it received a long I mean a boost during the war when titles like Captain America and the sealed were gaining huge popularity based on the theme of patriotism and Nazi hatred. However, as soon as the war period came to an end, the demand for warlike properties in the comics market decreased manifold leading to a rise in the artist desire to create a demand. So, comic creators realized that they had not yet catered to one of the most vital part of the society and decided to finally cast in one of the family audience the teenage girls, the housewives hence newly formed Archie's comics witnessed wonderful sales. So, these numbers would also face a blow with certain development taking place in the 1950s. So, if you see these comics let us say action comics or detective comics where Batman is introduced or Superman is introduced there is also certain cultural meaning behind it. So, when you are like you have to ask why these kind of a figure were generated uh, by American artist because there was American dreams where they wanted to show that we are the only powerful people, we are the one who can save the world. In fact, there is a huge cultural critique of these kind of uh, pictures or this kind of heroism or masculinity portrayed in our society. And you see that literature had a connection with the ideology and which is why you remember that to certain extent I personally believe that literature is also responsible for the first and second world war for the reason that if you read most of the English uh, novels or let us say English stories, Jews were hardly projected as a kind of a nice human being, right. Even the Fagin, I am sure that was a Jew, I am sure you know that. And if you look at uh, Silok, was also a Jew in the Merchant of Venice. So, they are always projected as a bad people. So, you see interestingly that that is how ideology gets circulated and people tend to believe that what is written, the way it is represented, it is true. However, they do not question the very idea of representation itself. But here let us not talk about the politics of representation or theory of representation. What I am talking about the question that I am raising is that you all have to think about that it is just not about superman, it is about the masculinity, it is about the chivalry, it is about that how patriotism or let us say uh, nationalism idea is boosted or let us say Americanism most appropriate when we are going to explore detective comics or action comics, right. So, our job is also to look and critique these kind of idea being circulated by action by these uh, comics. And second thing is that you see that when I was talking about that these kind of uh, comics were very popular during the war when people are fighting because these kind of uh, 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 comics are talking about Nazi hatred or it is showing that there are some kind of bad people who must be wiped out. So, I am sure that if you read uh, this Batman and all you see the kind of figure are projected and the kind of people who are bad and for whom they are fighting and these people representing America as a uh, people who can save this world. All right. So, what I am saying that you should read this comic as a like 
as a, a part of a cultural critique. All right. So, going back to the slide, here you see Archie's also coming, where it is generally after that talking about uh, uh, simply uh, about the girls and the boys and other simple, simple things, so that it can become, uh, it can, it can remain in existence and people read and people uh, uh, like it can be consumed by the people, right. So, holding uh, uh, here we come, then we have a, someone called this is an interesting thing and where uh, we are going to talk about psychiatric Frederick Wertham, right. And he wrote a tract against comic books by the name of Seduction of the Innocent, right. Seduction of the Innocent and uh, the influence of comic books on today's youth and it created an image that comics were uncensored reading material for young kids and teenagers and could easily mold their personality based on aberrant vigilant behavior like that of Batman or even foster passive homosexuality at an early age having consumed that media about Batman and Robin's terms of endearment and closeness. This concern made it difficult for creator to express their story freely, alright. So, see what I am going to talk, why uh, I am talking about this seduction of the innocent by Frederick, uh, 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 this uh, psychiatrist called uh, Frederick uh, Wertham, right. The reason is that as we see that literature and censorship they go hand in hand, right. Even in the restoration period, you see that uh, people were not uh, for the drama, someone against the drama, even theatre was closed for some period of time, the interregnum, uh, that, that, that is how it is called. So, you see that censorship and, and literature, they go hand in hand. There are a lot of people who believe that literature can influence the mind of a young kids and it can affect uh, hugely and to certain extent if you see comics for like the seduction of the innocent in this book also Frederick Wertham is talking the same thing right. He in fact is advocating that these kind of a comics must not be read by young kids and they are influencing these comics are influencing young minds and they may become. Uh, like they may get subjected to homosexualities, right or uh, they may get prone to some bad habits. I do not know what exactly bad habits we mean, but look at the society and understand what bad habits are and accordingly he is trying to advocate, right. And it resulted in a very adverse effect it had on comics. So, let me uh, show you the slide which make uh, the idea more clear to you. So, here you see that this uh, 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 this seduction of the innocent after this publication of the book almost almost all publication went out of business except 27 of them and out of these 27 there were 24 who gathered together in new york on september 7 1954 and gave birth to comic magazine association of america which was headed by the owner of archie comics and i'm sure that you know archie comics are very familiar then dc marvel and harvey comics you are very like they all are very popular so from january 1955 it became mandatory to have the seal of the comics code authority as created by the cmaa which means comic magazine association of america so, the four big companies had most to gain from this deal while William Gaines of Entertainment Comics, a staunch advocate of freedom of expression, drifted away to create his own empire of underground comics. And the 1960 saw a counter-cultural rebellion where the likes of William Gaines strived to distribute their comics without the CCA seal and it was a hard fought battle. Something happened in the underground comic scene in 1976 
that never happened before at a time when comics were mostly consumed based on property sold gains began a trend of a branding the comics you see the spelling with a picture and a short bio note of the comic artist who had contributed to the particular comic and this practice caught hold of the public as they slowly got to know that the people behind the comics they once loved so much and hence there was a shift brought about by the counter cultural resistance in the pattern of a consumption in the comics market as the hold of cmaa was dwindling with the time with a majority of publishers reopening without caring about the cca seal america started to see an auto driven industry let me write it for you all right driven auto driven industry rather than a property driven one as it was hence for all right so to conclude the comic artist at the forefront of this movement were the most popular names in the underground comics world who would go on to bring varied experimentation into the field artist like uh, let me write it a name for you spigel man and obviously very famous one will asner right these two names spigel man spigel man and will asner were the torch bearer of this underground counter cultural resistance that created the space for conversation among the members of the comic world it's interesting to note that the pioneer of the graphic novel format or the first comics theorist in english speaking word came directly from this counter culture space and went on to become the mainstream form of a comics conception in a matter of a couple of decades so the first graphic novel this came out in 8, 1986 this paved the way for further works of the similar order especially alternative comics that did not have to adhere to the rules of its wild comic production the same artist would inspire the rest of the world to create works that look and feel similar to the structuration followed in the united states keeping up the narrative that this is a medium that american have wanted to develop a monopoly of so here you see that how counter culture was produced that initially because of that psychiatrist uh, <coughs> the people started abhorring comics because they thought that it is polluting our mind it is polluting our kids mind but then later on people got anxious the artist got anxious that this is now how it's going to be so what they did there are certain artist who were writing this and they were very very famous names right people loved him or her like anything so what did did happen they their name or biography was brought and it was labeled on that comics right so people who were fan of that Uh, that particular comic artist and when they saw their name they started reading again right so which means that see i'm not talking about that how censorship is bad or good this is not our job to talk over here so what are we talking about that what are the challenges what are the crisis right what are the challenges it faced what are the crisis comics have gone through and it survived and it is booming and it is going to be uh, the uh, it is going to be very important medium to for for express something in our society right as salvador dali has in fact said like we discuss that once it is going to be very prevalent in uh, in our society people will read and people will take it very seriously so here what i did i talked about the challenges the crisis the problem it has gone through it has faced and still it is and i also the kind of experiment and also the kind of innovation it evolved and lot of people i also spoke hogarth rawlinson krushank and others and their contribution and their development all right so this all are very important if we are getting to know a particular discipline or we are going to read about a particular medium all right so for now uh, 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 i am i'll request once again that please read 
as I suggested, the please the yellow kid to know what happens and the archies and the superman to know the ideology, how comics became a medium to circulate American ideology in the society, right? Or to show its dominance over different world or over a distant society altogether. In the next lecture, and we are going to talk about about theory that is associated with the need and uh, uh, invest some of your energy into it. The theory of comics. All right. So see you. Take care.